We began a new sermon series last week called For Lakewood, For Eternity. And we began uh, by preaching and teaching out of John chapter 15, uh, where Jesus said that I've appointed you to produce everlasting fruit. And so we talked about this idea that as individuals and as a church, we are to be in the business of producing lasting fruit. That as a church, we need to recognize that our mission, our focus, everything we're about should be for eternity, to do things that have eternal value. And so last week we talked about the mandate of the church. And this morning, we're gonna talk about the mission of the church. And we're gonna look first at Matthew chapter 28. We're gonna look at two passages of scripture this morning as our text. And they're what's called in scripture parallel passages. Uh, most scholars believe that they refer to the same event uh, written from two different perspectives. If not the same event, then at least a similar event where Jesus gave a mandate to his followers, to his disciples. Matthew chapter 28, beginning in verse 16, it says, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this passage of scripture is often referred to as the Great Commission. As Jesus, right before he ascends into heaven, takes the 11 uh, men who have followed him, who have been through so much, and he gives them this mission to do as he leaves them uh, from an earthly uh, presence. We want to also look this morning at Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse number 8. Jesus Christ is speaking again to his, his disciples and he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. And so God has given to us a, a mission as well. And as a church, specifically as Belmar churches, we're going to go along in this series. I, I kind of envision it as a funnel that we're talking about some big, uh, all-encompassing principles. But as we go along, we're going to be talking about more and more specific things, specific to us as a church and specific to us as individual members or parts of the church. And so this morning, we want to talk about the mission of the church. And the mission of the church, and we're going to get into this in more detail, but is to make disciples. Amen. It's to make disciples. That's why we are here. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's awesome that you're here this, this Sunday because we're going to talk about that. But the first thing that I want us to see is that we don't have to be perfect. I love the intro to Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16 that we see. Then the 11 disciples left for Galilee. Now, there were 12, right? But Judas betrayed Christ. Later in Acts, they're going to sort of uh, install another as, as part of the 12. But there's 11 guys. And they're headed to where Jesus had commanded them. Going to the mountain where Jesus had told them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. They saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And I was thinking about this. I was like, what were they doubting? I mean, here he was. 
Were they doubting that he was the Messiah? Were they doubting that he had risen from the grave? Were they doubting like just, you know, I don't really know what I'm doing with my life? But the more I thought about this and the more I kind of meditated upon this passage of scripture, to be honest with you, the more encouraged it made me. Because if these guys who spent three years of their life every day with Jesus, they saw him take a boy's lunch and feed thousands. They saw the blind man regain sight. They heard Lazarus be called out by Jesus, saw him come out from the grave. They smelled the rotting flesh and the grave clothes on him. They were with Jesus every step of the way. They were there on that hillside when Jesus sat down and he began to teach the Sermon on the Mount. Every time that Jesus taught and and the crowds were blown away because he taught as one having authority, they heard it. They didn't just hear what the crowds heard, but they heard the inner conversation when they would get alone with Jesus and they would go, what did you really mean by that? And he would go, let me tell you. These were those guys. And then they saw him betray. Imagine how angry they were with Judas. Imagine how heartbroken they were to see Jesus hanging on the cross. They knew he was laid in the tomb. And they thought that everything that they had believed and everything that they had been been working toward was a lie and then they had run some of them to the grave that morning that Sunday morning and the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was empty and the angel said he's not here he's risen and the joy that they had felt and then they had seen Jesus on several occasions they he had cooked breakfast for him on the seashore and here they are on the mountain but some of them doubted Don't you look at that and think, how in the world could they doubt? After all that? But how could we? I mean, after all that Christ has done for us, after all the obstacles that we face and the prayers that we pray up and and the answers that come, and then we're faced with other obstacles and we lack faith and we doubt. And that encouraged me. Because in the middle of that, Jesus, knowing that they're doubting, says, I got a mission for you. I've got a job for you. See, God's plan involves using imperfect people. If you're here today and you possess all talent and all knowledge and you never do anything wrong, That's not who God's plan is designed for. Luckily, I was watching as many of you came in and I think we're in luck today. (laughs) You're like, did he just insult us? (laughs) Us. I'm with you. Acts chapter four and verse eight talks, it records for us after Peter and John have been arrested, they had healed a man at the gate of the temple, a beggar, and they are being questioned. And in verse eight, Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you wanna know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, for Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which he must be saved. Peter, the fisherman, The denier three times on the night that Christ was betrayed, maybe one of the ones who on that mountain worshiped God and doubted at the same time, stands up and in front of the high priest and the council of Jerusalem, the highest Jewish governing body that that there is, makes this bold proclamation. 
And notice the response in verse number 13. The members of the councils were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. These men of the council, many of them had studied the scriptures from the earliest of ages. For some of them, they could quote the better part of the entire Old Testament. They were experts in God's word. And they are being preached to by a fisherman. A man that they would deem as uneducated, unlearned, and ordinary. But there were two things about that scenario that they couldn't die, couldn't deny. One, they had been with Jesus. And oh, by the way, the crippled guy was standing there. He wasn't sitting there. He was standing there. He had been sitting at the gate of the temple begging. He was standing there. And Peter could stand up and say, I'm sorry, what's the crime we're being accused of? And I imagine the guy in the back, the crippled guy still in the back going, it's working. Probably one of those dudes that couldn't keep still. Peter was a man who had faults. He often spoke first and thought later. He often said he was going to do things that he couldn't do. In the, one of the biggest pressure-filled moments of his life when Jesus Christ was, was betrayed and put on trial, he first reacted with violence and then he lied and cursed and denied he knew Christ. His failures were many, but God used him in a mighty and powerful way. And oh, by the way, in Acts chapter four, it tells us that thousands believed on Jesus because of the message of Peter. God's plan is to use imperfect men and women. You say, preacher, I don't have enough faith. There were people, there were disciples right there on the mountain when Jesus is right there worshiping him and yet doubting. Some doubted. But God desires to grow our faith. Colossians chapter two and verse six says, and now just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. Let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Listen, God's desire is that like a plant grows, our faith would grow. As we see God work, we would grow in our faith. We use terms like that in church all the time, but I wonder sometimes, do we even really think about it? We talk about walking by faith and growing in our faith. Listen, that means that when faced with greater and greater challenges, when, when faced with larger and larger obstacles, we should have greater faith to recognize God's ability to overcome those things. We don't, we don't like to think of it that way. We like to think, well, I just want to have the faith to receive greater and greater blessings. Amen? But that's not always the way it works. That's not what it means to grow in our faith. If you study both in the Bible and outside of Scripture what tradition and history tells us, those 11 men, all of them, did amazing things for the cause of Christ. 10 of the 11, history tells us, were killed for their faith. The other John was exiled to an island and boiled in oil. That didn't kill him. He died of uh, an old man. But he too proclaimed Jesus Christ and, and had, those 11 men had a, an impact on the entire known world but they weren't perfect. What they were is they were men who God grew their faith and they were willing to be used by God and his spirit 
powerfully use them. And the same God and the same spirit is available to us. And so will we allow God, even in our imperfection, even in our doubting, to use us? See, the key is not us and our imperfection and our lack of faith. The key is God and his power. In in Matthew 28, Jesus said this. He told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. Now, it's interesting the way that that that's phrased, right? He says, listen, I've got all power. I've got all authority. Now, you would think that the natural thing would be, so I'm going to go. But that's not what he said. He did go. He descended. He ascended. But he said, I've been given all the pow- all power. I've been given all authority. So you need to go. The implication being that his power and his authority is available to us. In Acts chapter one and verse eight, he said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. We're not gonna take a lot of time to look at this. We talked about this last week and we're gonna be talking about it in the weeks to come. I put several verses there on the back of your bulletin. Uh, If you're interested, you can read through those. But listen, we're not skipping over this because it's not important. We're skipping over this, A, because of time and B, because we talked about it last week. But it's the most important thing. I, this week, I went to a, uh, into a place to grab some breakfast. And uh, there was a motorcycle out front. And uh, I, I'm drawn to motor. I love motorcycles. And I was, I was kind of checking it out. And, and uh, I went to the motorcycle shop yesterday. And uh, I told my wife, I just, I went out to do something else. But then I ended up at the motorcycle shop and, and I needed a couple of things anyway, but then I got a couple of things I didn't need. And, uh, but I resisted buying some big things that I really didn't need. But it, it's tough, you know, because the way they do it at the shop that I was at is the parts are right in the middle. And they just, they work at these little desks and they look them up on the computer and then the lady left to get the parts and then I'm just left there standing surrounded by all these shiny things and I get easily distracted. <laughs> My cool, look at this one. I just got distracted there. What I was going to say is I went in to get breakfast. There was a motorcycle there. I was checking it out. And I walked in and I'm standing in line. The guy in front of me is wearing a riding jacket with a backpack and a helmet. And I'm not very smart, but I thought to myself, I bet that guy belongs to that bike. <laughs> and so I said to him, hey man, what, you know, what's up with your bike? What kind of engines it got? That's the first question I asked, what kind of engines it got? And he's like, I don't know, it's a loader. <laughs> and I thought, what kind of man are you? But anyway... <laughs> I'm just kidding. He had just jumped on it. But the first question I asked him was, you know, what's the configuration of that engine? What's the performance of it? Why? Because in a motorcycle, like looking cool is important, but it's basically just an engine and a couple of wheels. And man, you want to know how does it perform? Listen, we can't do anything without the engine, spiritually speaking, and that is the Holy Spirit. That is God's power working in us. So it's not that the engine isn't important. But we want to move on this morning and talk about the mission that God has given us. Go therefore, therefore go, Matthew 28, 19, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The first thing that I see when it comes to making disciples, is that we're to make disciples of all nations. Jesus Christ came, the Son of God, stepped down from heaven because the Father looked at the world, saw the world in need, loved the world, and sent his Son to sacrifice himself for the world. Now I I want you to understand something. Every man, woman, and child upon the face of the earth is the object 
of that love of God the Father. Every man, woman, and child upon the face of the earth is the object of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. God does not love anybody more or less than he loves you. But he also doesn't love anybody any more or less than he loves you. You're not loved more. Jesus doesn't love us because of, 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 our, of our skin color. He doesn't love us because of our nationality. I, can, I believe I can make the case from scripture, Jesus doesn't love America any more than he loves another country. And I didn't say that Jesus doesn't love America or that I don't love America. So don't send me those emails. You think I'm joking. I make statements like that and then I get letters in the mail from people who don't sign them because they say, well, I know your politics. You know what, you don't know my politics, frankly, because my politics aren't what's important. What I'm telling you is the object of God's love is all the nations. I watch the news and I see people that fight against our nation. I see people whose ideology, because of their religion, because of their ideology, they hate me. But that is not an excuse for me to hate them. I'm not saying as a country we shouldn't fight wars. I'm not, I'm not saying those things. But I'm talking about our personal attitude towards people. You see somebody that looks different than you, that dresses different than you. And you automatically have disdain for them or do you look at them as the object of almighty God's love? Do you recognize that Jesus Christ shed his blood for them? And even if you recognize that, do you recognize it on social media? Because we, we operate in environments where we can just make people the object of our disdain or our hatred or whatever. And we don't recognize them as people sometimes. They're just somebody that did something that we don't like. I was driving down the street yesterday and this nameless, faceless person decided that even though we were in a 45 mile an hour zone and I was going 45 miles an hour, it was perfectly acceptable for them to pull out in front of me in the left lane and do 20 miles an hour. And you know what? I wasn't thinking about how God loved them at that moment. <laughs> my first thought was, oh golly, I got to slam on the brakes. And my second thought was, I would like to be about God's business of exacting a little vengeance on them, amen? But even that person, man, woman, I really don't know, Jesus died for them. God loves them just as much as he loves me. And Jesus, it, it's, Listen, this was a revolutionary idea. When Jesus said, make disciples out of all nations, he was saying it to 11 Jewish guys who loved to refer to themselves as God's chosen people. And God said, make disciples out of all nations. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine says, and after this, John's writing, he gets this revelation from God and he gives us a vision of what heaven is like. He says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. God did not discriminate when he sent Jesus Christ to die. He died for the entire world. And God help us if we discriminate about to whom we take the gospel. Moving on. The gospels, we're to make disciples of all nations. How are we to do that? We're to be witnesses. 
In Acts chapter one and verse eight, Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. In Matthew 28, he says, make disciples. But in Acts 1, eight, he doesn't say make disciples. He says, be my witness. Making disciples is not, it's not a forcible thing, right? If we didn't have the rest of scripture, we could just think, well, yeah, I'm going to make me some disciples. You know, I'll just twist their arm until they, but that's not it. How do we do it? We do it by being witnesses. Luke chapter two and verse 17. Remember the story in Luke two, right? It's a Christmas story. And the shepherds are there and the angels come and they proclaim the message that Jesus Christ is born. They go into Bethlehem and they find this baby laying in a manger in a, in a, a barn or a, 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 a stall, a cave perhaps. And there's Mary and Joseph and they recognize that this is God's promised Messiah. And after seeing him, Luke 2, 17, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. I've said this before, but can you imagine you're that shepherd? Like you're going to tell that story for the rest of your life. Back just a couple of weeks ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And I was thinking about that. If you're Buzz Aldrin, who was, is still alive and, and was the second man to step foot on the moon, is there ever been a time since the, in the last 50 years that Buzz Aldrin sat down and shared a meal with someone for the first time that they didn't ask him about landing on the moon? I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine if you had lunch this afternoon with Buzz Aldrin, never met him before, you sit down, you're like, hey, Buzz, you know, I, I, I hear you invest in real estate. Uh, how's that going? Hey, Buzz, you've, you've done some amazing things in your life, you know, and, and you talk to him about that. And, hey, listen, how long is it going to be before you go, hey, dude, what was it like to be on the moon? I mean, aren't you going to get to that pretty quick? You're going to go through the whole meal and go, eh, you know, I guess that was probably cool too. Are you kidding me? I'm going to be like, what did this spacesuit feel like? How high could you jump? Did you really hit a golf ball? I think that was a later Apollo mission. But anyway, that's not the point. I want to know everything. Because he's Buzz Aldrin and there's just a few guys that have been to the moon. I imagine that's how those shepherds were. Their kids had probably heard the story hundreds of times, but when you sat down for the first time, he'd go, man, let me tell you about this night right outside of Bethlehem. Why? Because the event was so significant, it defined their lives. And we are to be witnesses to the fact that we were destined to spend eternity separated from God in eternal judgment, but because God loved us and not because of anything we had done or even because we were worthy of his love, he sent his son Jesus to die as a sacrifice for us so that every wrong thing I've ever done and I ever will do is forgiven by the God of this universe, is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and my eternal destiny is sealed to spend forever for eternity with God in heaven in a place where, where the foundation are stones that are precious here on earth of emerald and diamond and, and gold is the asphalt of the streets and there doesn't need to be any light. The lion lays down with the lamb. We can't even comprehend the beauties and the glories of heaven and that is where I will be forever because God loved me. It is the defining, it's the defining event in my life. 
How could I be quiet about it? How could I keep it a secret? How could I be like, oh yeah, that too. Jesus said, you want to make disciples, be witnesses. Just tell what's happened to you. Acts 22, verse 11, we'll not take the time to read all of that, but Paul's at Jerusalem, he's giving his testimony, and and he, he recalls the words of Ananias when he came and laid hands on him and restored his sight and baptized him. He said, for you are to be, in verse 15, you are to be his witness, telling everyone what you have seen and heard. That is the definition of a witness. You say, well, preacher, I don't have the answer to all the questions that people ask me sometimes. Listen, a witness just tells what they've seen and heard. If God has made a difference in your life, you're to be a witness of that. And what you don't know, you don't know. It doesn't excuse us from not studying or trying to find some answers. But listen, we're to be witnesses. If you witness a crime, You witness a guy and and he goes over to a car and breaks out the window and unlocks the door and shoves a screwdriver where the key goes. It's an old car like that, not the new ones with the button. But anyway, turns it and drives away. You don't have to be an expert on how to steal a car. You don't have to be an expert on how the glass shattered. You're just like, well, I was right here and it was a red car and this is what happened. You tell what happened. And to make disciples... We're to be witnesses. So what is a disciple? We're gonna roll through this. Remember last week when the message was a little short? Just reminding you. Um, We're gonna be done on time, I promise you, but we're gonna roll through this. What is a disciple? First of all, a disciple is someone who's born again. John chapter three, right? Jesus said, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He has this, this interaction with Nicodemus about being born again. We are born physically, but we're born spiritually dead. And in order to be a disciple, we've got to start a spiritual life. We have to be born again. Not only that, but we, uh, we're to be baptized. Colossians chapter two and verse 12 says, for you were buried with Christ when you were baptized and with him, you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Baptism is the outward symbol of what God has done in your heart. And it's a command that we all have and that God has given to us. So to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus, we need to be born again. We need to be baptized. We need to be obedient to him. Not only that, but we need to be learning. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20 says, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. Well, you can't be, you're not really teaching unless somebody is learning. With me? So we've got to be learning. We've got to be finding out new things about our relationship with God. Colossians chapter one and verse nine says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. Paul's writing to the church at Colossians. He said, we ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to to know God better and better. Listen, you don't come to a place in your walk with God, in your spiritual life, in being a disciple where you're like, well, I got it all figured out. I've got it all together. Listen, that doesn't happen. If you're here this morning, you're like, well, you know, we've got the Bible and I've read it from front to back. Listen, I would encourage you, read it again. You're going to find new things. That's been my experience. Bible's living word, scripture says. And it makes application to our lives all the time. We don't come to a point of arrival. We don't come to a point where we've got it all figured out. God is always teaching us and growing us. And because we're imperfect and because we're not fully in the image of his son, he's always working in our lives to make us more in the image of his son. So when we talk about making disciples, it's someone who's born again, who's baptized, who's learning and who is obedient. 
Because it's not just about gaining knowledge. It's not just about learning more and more and acquiring more facts. It's about the application of those things that, that God's word and as we learn should have an effect on the way that we act. Teaching them to obey all things. John 15, 14 says, Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command. Philippians chapter two and verse 12 says, dear friends, you always followed my instruction when I was with you. And now that I am away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Shining like bright lights in a, wonder, in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Listen, we shine as lights when we obey God's word. So we've got to learn and we've got to obey. These things should be in our life. But as a church, when we're fulfilling the mission that God has given to us of making disciples, this is what it means. We want to proclaim the gospel. We want to see people born again, going from light or from darkness to light, from death to life. We want to see people baptized and committed to growing in Christ, to learning and to obeying. And so as a church, that needs to be our focus, the making of disciples. And all of us need to be involved in that business. All of us need to be witnesses. But the truth is that some of us have different gifts. Some of us are more inclined to evangelism, to declaring, uh, being a witness to see people being born again. Some of us are more inclined to be teachers, to instruct people and help them to grow and learn the things of God. Some of us have a more prophetic gift by where we call out things in other people's lives and, and, and help encourage them to obey God's word. But all of us need to be involved in the business of being disciples and making disciples. Finally this morning in Acts chapter one, after Jesus tells people, his followers to be witnesses. He was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white robed men stud suddenly stood among them. I envision 11 guys, mouths open, maybe they're blocking the sun, maybe they're squinting a little bit, you ever watch the balloon float up into the sky? I mean, it's right there, and then you can still see it good, and then it's just a little dot. That's how I envision Jesus. And then he's gone, and then they're just like, and then two angels appear. They say, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus is taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. And in the meantime, God's given you something to do. But folks, time is ticking. Time is short. We are on the clock. I love sports. Sports are interesting. My wife loves baseball. I love my wife, but <laughs> baseball is interesting because there's no clock. It's not done until there's a last out. Remember a couple years ago, I was living in Texas at the time, and uh, or maybe it was right after I moved here, but I knew a lot of Texas Ranger fans, and I don't mean to hurt them because we've got some, some here, but Texas Rangers were within one strike Twice, twice. I know Jason, I, I don't mean to rip the Band-Aid, but they were within one strike twice of winning the World Series. 
And I don't want to spoil it for you, but they didn't win the World Series. Because there's no clock. Right? If you're up by like 25 points in a basketball game and there's a minute left, you're going to win. But baseball's a little different. They're, until it's over, it's not over. But there's a clock. We don't know when Jesus Christ is going to return, but Scripture says, Jesus said that God, will, that Jesus will come back again. We don't know how long we have, but we need to make the most of our time. Ephesians 5 and verse 15 says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. That makes sense, right? Given a choice, I'd rather not live like a fool and live like someone who's wise. And then he follows it up. This is the very next sentence. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Make the most of the time that you have. Colossians 4 and verse 5 says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Listen, we don't know how much time we have, but God has called us as a people to make disciples, to be witnesses for him. And you can't say, I'm going to do it later, or maybe I'll get another chance. We don't know that we're going to have another chance. We need to make the most of every opportunity. Jesus will return I want to close with this passage this morning. Jesus said this in John 14. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I am going. If you know that passage in John chapter 14, his disciples said, we don't know the way. And then Jesus famously said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the father, but through me. Listen, as followers of Jesus Christ, our eternal forever destiny is secure in him. But our mission is to share that opportunity, that good news with those who we come into contact with, to be about making disciples. Listen, I'll be honest with you. As a church, if we're not in the disciple-making business, we're just sitting around. We're not doing what God has called us to do. Now, that means teaching and learning and growing and obeying. That is part of it but it also means being a witness to those who don't know. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of the wrong things that you've done. You've never put your trust in him and the sacrifice that he made. You've never been spiritually born again. Today, you could take that first step of faith. Maybe you're here this morning and you've received Christ, but you've never been baptized. And this morning, maybe you need to commit yourself to being baptized, to declaring that you are a follower of Jesus and to, and to make that public and obey his command. I don't know what your need is. Maybe you're here this morning and as I'm preaching, you're thinking about a coworker or a neighbor that you need to be a witness to. Maybe you've had some opportunities, but you thought later. Listen, we need to make the most of every opportunity. If you would, bow your head and close your eyes with me. We've got some folks, we've got a room right behind the coffee bar where uh, we've set that aside where people can talk and, and pray if they need to spend a little bit of time doing that. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your savior, 
Maybe you've got some questions about that. You're not sure what that means. There are people right now making their way to the back that would love to meet you at the back of the auditorium or out in the lobby and talk to you about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe this morning you want to commit uh, to be baptized and you can make your way to the back as well. You can also check that on your connection card. God, I just pray that as we receive your word today, that you would make application to our hearts and to our lives. God, I pray that you would help us to be serious about this business of making disciples, of making the most of every opportunity that we have. God, even this week, give us the courage to pray for opportunities to be a witness and then give us, give us the courage and the empowering of the Holy Spirit uh, to, uh, to, to tell other people that God loves them and that there is forgiveness of the wrong things we've done and there is eternity in heaven if we will trust in Jesus Christ. God, help us to share and show the love of God to those who need it this week. Lord, help Belmar Church be a place where disciple making is in full mode. We love you today. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.